one hardly knows where to begin. As a relatively new scholar, she has done a huge amount and a great variety of work in multiple fields of study. Uh, she's a historian and one who is extremely well versed in one what might call the seminal Western scholarly publications on Southeast Asia and its history. Texts that took the first steps towards attempting to look at that history from what these writers wanted to be not from the Orientalist perspective of colonialist storytelling, but at least starting to use local language sources to give respectful voice to the local creators of those sources. Um, as a person already in my 70s, who read and was intellectually and politically inspired by these works now half a century ago, I was glad to see that at least some of them are still considered worthy looking at, not only as an exercise in critical historiography, uh, which Dr. Nguyen so deftly does in her scholarship, but also because these works that she dissects help start debates that not only remain worth engaging, but are debates that have blossomed while being fundamentally transformed by subsequent generations of scholars of Southeast Asia who are increasingly Southeast Asian, whether by local birth and long life domicile or by family origin. In her writing and teaching, Dr. Nguyen very much showcases the growing repertoires of intellectually cutting edge work now being done by these Southeast Asian scholars, as well as the best of the contemporary work in history and other disciplines by Western scholars. So if you wanna know about today's debate, particularly in Southeast Asian history, but also in some other disciplines and in the humanities and the social sciences, all you have to do is go to Dr. Nguyen's website and scroll through the treasure trove there which includes her insightful reviews and other analyses of key past and present works on Southeast Asian history. Among those debates are those revolving around the wars in Indochina, where the question of the positionality of the authors is of perhaps even greater importance than in the case of Southeast Asian studies generally. That is because the wars and their consequences so profoundly affected the historical, political, and cultural trajectories of the Indochinese countries and peoples and the scholars who were impacted by them. In particular, these scholars' political and psychological reactions to the wars profoundly shaped the ways in which both the Westerners and Indochinese scholars among them who were somehow involved in or observed the wars in their legacies and then wrote about them. Again, you can see on Dr. Nguyen's website, not only where she puts herself in this picture, but also extremely useful summaries and depictions of the key divides and development over time in how the wars in Vietnam have been understood by various schools of thought, and how these schools of thought are linked to the political positions vis-a-vis -vis those wars held by the authors writing within one school or another. Um, it's easy to imagine trying to do something similar on scholars and scholarship on the wars in Cambodia, which as someone implicated in the debates about those wars, I think would broadly mirror the categories that Dr. Nguyen has put forward for Vietnam. This brings me to my final point. Very rightly, in my view, Dr. Nguyen takes very seriously the historical importance of the notion of something called Indochina. Indeed, she has an online talk uh, with the title, Why Study the History of Colonial Indochina? In which she argues for its importance while warning her audience that doing so is not easy. I would certainly say that indeed it is not. And to refer back to what I just said about the problems of positionality and looking at the wars in Indochina, colonial and post-colonial, one can see the importance of this. A big part of why it is not easy is because what elsewhere might be rather civil academic debate 
is often morally and politically hyper supercharged in the scholarship on these wars because it has to do at least in part with the causes, the conduct and the consequences of events that constituted what international criminal law now calls war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. We can't help but know or at least suspect that somehow or another, what happened during colonial Indochina is connected with these atrocities and that the differences in the extent to which they occurred in the various parts of Indochina must have something to do with the differences in the way colonial rule was conducted in those various parts. To my mind, this is one of the many reasons why Dr. Nguyen's comparative work on colonial era libraries and their effects on the intellectual, social, political, and cultural features of Vietnam and Cambodia is so important. For that reason and many others, it is therefore my pleasure to now present Dr. Nguyen. Thank you so much, Steve, for such a, a thoughtful and well-informed just introduction to my work and the breadth of my scholarship and teaching. I, I very much appreciate that and look forward to engaging you further um, as I continue on with this talk. So let me just set up to share my screen and make sure that's all squared away. So I can, okay. So again, thank you so much to Steve for that introduction. And thank you especially um, to the Center for Kamai Studies for this opportunity to present my work, um, to the CKS team, Samedi, Siv Lang, uh, Shailak, who made my research time in Cambodia meaningful in scholarly and personal ways. I'm Dr. Cindy Nguyen, a historian of Southeast Asia and currently a University of California Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow at University of California in San Diego. So for today's event, we'll be structured as follows. Um, the focus will be on the second section where I walk through my initial research findings and argumentative claims to understanding histories of Cambodia, colonialism and libraries more broadly. And I'll conclude with discussion of my ongoing work in time for questions and discussion. So a little bit of context, I was awarded a senior research fellowship for two months of field work by the Center for Khmer Studies and I conducted my work primarily in Phnom Penh in 2022. I was accompanied by my research assistants, also known as my one-year-old baby and partner, Eric. So during that short time, I conducted most of my work in the National Archives pictured here, as well as the National Library. Um, some word of thanks is very much in order to thank the directors, Kelsoni, and the supportive staff at the archives, the National Library Director, Kot Vibola, as well as the Buddhist Institute Director, Sorsokni, for sharing their expertise and their time. My most meaningful experiences were conversations and learning from researchers and advocates who've been working in Cambodia for a very long time, advancing important work. I think specifically Tara Tran, Yuk Chang, Helen Jarvis, and Margaret Bywater, and of course, my mentor, Penny Edwards, for inspiring my scholarly curiosity to pursue nuanced histories of print culture. So this brief research trip laid the foundation for my study of the Colonial Library, and I very much look forward to the chance to return to continue this research. So who am I? Um, my research and teaching is layered by four fields of scholarly practice. First, as a cultural historian of Southeast Asia, Second, a studies of libraries and information, and by extension, looking very critically at history of books and history of knowledge. Third is digital humanities as an expansive arena of critical research. And fourth, as a public and using public arts as a platform to empower communities and make accessible knowledge. So my commitment to centering diversity of experiences and methodologies is central to my teaching. I'm a teaching fellow on the International Virtual Anchor Digital Humanities Project for Digital History. And you can visit that online at virtualanchor.com. It's an expansive visualization of 13th century Angkor in Cambodia as an urban metropolis through immersive virtual reality and 360 video simulation. In my teaching, 
I center history as lived, embodied, and dynamic. I guide students to think critically about data and representation from looking at historic primary sources, such as travel logs and photographs, to digital public projects like virtual Angkor. And through that, students learn skills to recognize the silences in the archives, as well as ways in which we can platform diverse ways of experiencing and thinking about history and different types of narratives. So my book project is titled Bibliotactics, the social life of libraries and colonial control in Vietnam, and investigates the historical development of, Viet of, 20th, uh, of libraries in 20th century Vietnam as a contested social world of reading, as well as a political tool of the French colonial state. Through this book project, I argue two parts. First, that libraries legitimize the authority of the state as infrastructures of symbolic modernity, print control, and cultural propaganda. Second, I reveal the everyday operations and negotiations of the colonial institution of the library. I propose this concept of bibliotactics to characterize the, the everyday agency of builders and users to shape the vision and reality of the library. Readers were active individuals cultivating their own erudition, creating a distinctive public reading culture. Readers were also participating in plural forms of dissent, ranging from socializing in public space and violating official library decorum to public critique and boycotting the library. The chapters in the book follow a historic structure focused on the cultivation of five practices to document, to be in public, to read, to control, and to collect. So I'm deeply rooted in the historic archive sources and specificity of, of Vietnamese history. Yep, I also want to advance the following analytical lenses to trace the political significance and cultural use of the two library institutions. My aspiration as I develop this critical lens of bibliotactics is that it could speak beyond the case of colonial Vietnam, very much to the point that Steve was talking about, thinking critically in the context of Indochina as well as beyond. So these five practices to document, to be in public, to read, to control, to collect, can be extrapolated as a method and a model for critically analyzing colonial institutions, specifically libraries. For this talk, I'll draw from my bibliotactics model, specifically the first two, to document and to be in public, to analyze the historic nuances and social life of the library institution in colonial Cambodia. So my three research questions center the history of the colonial library in Cambodia, also called the Bibliothèque Centrale or the Bibliothèque du Cambodge. So first on a simple level is the argument and question what was the social, political, and cultural role of the library during the colonial period? Second is how was it used? What did it symbolize? And third is thinking more generally and broadly is what lessons can we understand about Cambodian history, documentation, and histories of libraries from studying a colonial institution from nearly a hundred years ago? So my research findings led me to argue the following. The Cambodge Central Library was an important institution that carried out a Western construct of textual authority in public. So textual authority reinforced a Western hierarchy of knowledge where French language texts, literature, colonial documents were considered unquestionably valuable and should be reserved and disseminated through an extensive building project of the Central Library. The building itself was a monument, a symbol of French authority and the cultural primacy of French language, knowledge in the protectorate of Cambodge. Symbolically, the colonial library claimed to serve a vague notion of public. Yet this notion of public reified a civilizing mission where French literature would cultivate minds and provide civilizing education and healthy entertainment. This notion of public was limited and only extended to an elite group of literate urban few colonial administrators, French expatriates, and a small number of Cambodian high school and university students. So in this webinar, I'll walk through these three archival research findings grouped in this way that led me to this argumentative claim about textual authority and the public. The first group of findings pertains to the process of building colonial institutions throughout Indochina. 
Specifically, I examined the construction and architecture of the Cambodia Library and how it shaped the question of access to the library's space. So Cambodia became a protectorate of France in 1863 and Phnom Penh was reinstated as the capital. It's during the late 19th century that Phnom Penh underwent this huge series of infrastructural projects to physically and racially transform the swampy, frequently prone to floods, small commercial region into a geometric urban scape. The early 20th century saw huge building projects such as canals that drained Phnom Penh's wetlands and also physically segregated Phnom Penh into quarters based on ethnicity and industry. The construction of the new central library and archives was to be firmly positioned in the European district or European quarter, the white neighborhood of Phnom Penh, where the colonial administration police offices were located. You can see the division of the ethnic neighborhoods in this 1925 map of Phnom Penh, with ethnic neighborhoods dividing up Phnom Penh into a European quarter in the north near the Wat Phnom Hill. South was the Chinese quarter around the central market, and south of that was the Cambodian and Vietnamese quarters. Prior to the building of the Cambodia Library in 1924, an administrative library of the the Protectorate operated from 1897 to 1914 with the resident superior of Cambodge, which was the colonial administrative apparatus in Cambodia. The Cambodge Library later inherited the collections of this library and in many ways continued to carry out the mission of an administrative library by serving a population of colonial administrators in Cambodia. So I unearthed an 1899 inventory where the administrative library had a range of books on agriculture, travel, administration, dictionaries, and periodicals. Furthermore, the library began to build up a collection of French popular liter literature from donations from Paris, including such works as Balzac, Alphonse Dolge, Alexandre Dumas, like the Three Musketeers, for example, um, or the Count de Monte Cristo. So I looked at a detailed checkout records that show how French administrators and Orientalist scholars borrowed from its wide collection covering this expansive topics. Uh, notably, I also found that the palace minister and colonial era administrator Thion used the collection borrowing the French Cambodian dictionary in 1897 and again in 1899, as well as borrowed administrative bulletins in 1895 and 1899. While there was this administrative library in operation since the turn of the 19th century, a systematic archive did not yet exist. The resident superior of Cambodia issued a decree to maintain archives in 1911, yet it was not until 1921 that plans for centralized management of archives together with libraries were implemented more consistently. So beginning in 1921, discussion began to purchase land and sketch out architectural plans for a library and archives building. The resident superior purchased from a civil society a plot of land which bought, which also had a two-story brick building called the Bibliothèque Populaire de Phnom Penh, which operated also as a Masonic lodge. As shown in this architectural plan to the right, the initial visions involved extending the existing library to build out the red portion. The overall vision was to create a structure with a central reading room and two wings to operate as offices and the library. The resident mayor decided to reject the plans and rebuild a library from scratch. The final plans for the central library followed a similar structure with a central reading room and two wings, which housed the lending section and administrative offices. So this is the final plan of which um, it is used in the National Library today in Cambodia. In Cambodia. So after many delays regarding the budget and the collections, the Bibliothèque de Phnom Penh or the Library of Phnom Penh, also called the Central Library of Cambodge, was opened to the public on December 24, 1924. This library absorbed the protectorate collections. So the official library report that announced this opening praised the modern construction design of the library building, which include the following a facade with Cambodian motifs using an Italian wall decor technique, a central reading room able to comfortably fit 30 readers and while lit by a central light and six stained glass windows, a lending library large enough to house 10,000 volumes, two large offices for librarians and a large surrounding garden. The library facade was characterized by its columned portico and neoclassical design. 
The Cambodian motifs decorate the exterior using Western techniques and a touch of art deco flourishes. A model to the right of the entranceway that reads, forest ties for a time, ideas bind forever. A Hanoi newspaper also praised the construction of the new library with robust underground cemented foundations and also its central location in Phnom Penh near sporting grounds. This article also commended the work of the French colonial state called the protector nation to build an institution with all the resources of human thought for the personal intellectual development of their protégés. The newspaper alluded to comparatively deprived state of libraries development in Phnom Penh compared to that of Hanoi and Saigon. The building existed as a symbolic representation of French political and cultural authority. From the architecture and the location in the French Quarter of Phnom Penh, to the French language and types of materials in the library, to the institution um, and the limitations of access, this institution was the promotion of this abstract Western notion of textual authority. The colonial library was situated within a landscape of colonial, cultural, political, academic institutions that included museums, the Pali School, the Research Institute, the École Française de Strain-Marriant, and the Royal Library and the Buddhist Institute. The Royal Library operated independently from 1921 to 29. In 1930, the Buddhist Institute was established and housed in the Royal Library building. The joint efforts of both the Royal Library and Buddhist Institute was spearheaded by its colonial era curator, Suzanne Carpelez, together with Cambodian Buddhist monks and leaders Chuan Nath and Ho Chath. The Buddhist Institute headquarters was in Phnom Penh and focused its efforts on Bali education, Buddhist publications, and in Indo-Chinese Buddhism throughout Cambodia, Laos, and Cochin, China. The Central Archives of Cambodia opened its operation on October 1st, 1926. It is located right behind the Central Library. The services of the Archives and Central Library of Cambodia were jointly organized under the direction of a curator, and personnel often circulated between the archives and the library services. So what was the relationship of the Central Libraries as joint institution of the archives to other colonial institutions, such as the Royal Library and the Buddhist Institute? I argue that the colonial institutions were organizational attempts to demarcate politics and social life into separate realms of secular and religious and religious politics. I extend here the important work of Penny Edwards on Suzanne Carpelez and the Buddhist Institute and Anne Hansen on Buddhist modernism. So Edwards examines how Khmeri nationalism and Buddhism efforts had roots within French colonialism, specifically the two institutes, the Royal Library and Buddhist Institute, social, political, and literary activity. The creation of the Central Library, the Royal Library and the Buddhist Institute were fundamental institutes in carving out realms of textual authority between the Sangha, the Buddhist monastic community, the Cambodian monarchy, and the French colonial administration. Both Hansen and Edwards argues for the importance of Buddhist textual practice, um, looking, thinking about how written texts were part of a performative tradition of Buddhist practice in which the word and art of listening were the modes of literacy and means of accumulating merit. The monarchy also carried its own textual tradition through court chronicles. So I extend the argumentation further in arguing that the Cambodge Central Library was an attempt to carve out a purely administrative and secular textual space. The Central Library carved out a separate sphere of textual authority, a documentation regime that was legible to the protectorate administration. The Central Library symbolized colonial power and a different documentation regime and linguistic universe of French language reading matter grounded in administrative reference work Orientalist literature and Francophone literature and leisure reading. So the, I show that the Central Library contributed to this bifurcation of textual worlds of religious and secular, but also of languages. The Central Library during the colonial period did not collect and circulate materials in Khmer and Pali in Chinese or Vietnamese, but only in French language materials. I also want to point out that there is a lot of work to be done here particularly in examining the relationship of institutions and the impact of French ideologies of secularism and religion. What is the impact of this bifurcation from a religious studies and indigenous authority and in understanding culture and society and politics? 
So my argument of textual authority is further supported by situating Cambodia Library into the wider contextual colonial Indochina state efforts. The Cambodia Central Library was part of an elaborate top-down French colonial infrastructure project throughout all of Indochina to centralize all documentation and colonial constructs of textual authority through creating a system of libraries and archives. So since the beginning of French colonialism in Indochina, government libraries and archives were created to provide documentation and reference matter for administrators as demonstrated in the Protectorate Library of Cambodge that operated at the turn of the 19th century. The Cochin China Library in Saigon operated from 1865 and was designated later as a public library um, open to anyone over the age of 18. In 1917, when the colonial government sought to centralize all documentation under the Directorate of Archives and Libraries of Indochina, the Directorate was an ambitious system of five archives and library institutions in each of the five regions of Indochina. So the regions are demarcated in this colored map with Cambodian red, Laos and green, and the three parts of modern day Vietnam, Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin China. The directorate was centralized in Hanoi, the new capital of French Indochina, where the Central Archives, Central Library, Legal Deposit, and the National Bibliography of Indochina were located. The Directorate of Archives and Libraries of Indochina also played a leading role in training and standardizing documentation work, record keeping, report writing, maintenance of archives and reference library collections throughout the colonial administration. Its efforts intersected with decades long efforts to rationalize the colonial bureaucracy through the creation of departments, offices, and a paper trail that followed colonial power. The Hanoi Library was opened in 1919 and operated as an extension of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris and as an Indochina state library in the colonial capital of Hanoi. The Central Library of, of Hanoi um, is the National Library of Vietnam today. So by 1941, the reading room of the Hanoi Library welcomed over 87,000 total visits by Vietnamese readers compared to about 4,000 French reader visits. The Hanoi Central Library was afforded a much larger budget comparatively as much as large libraries in France. So while the central libraries in Saigon and Phnom Penh were much less funded and organized as the Hanoi Library, Looking at the entirety of the Indochina Directorate of Archives and Library project is important because it was a fundamental part of building the French colonial state. The Cambodia Library was modeled exactly in, as the Hanoi Library that was opened in 1919. It had a reading room, a lending section was open to the public. The Cambodia Library was situated within an administrative apparatus and followed the procedure manuals that were developed in Hanoi. In the Q&A, we could discuss more about um, kind of the everyday differences between these libraries as well. So I argue that thinking about these three institutions in Hanoi, in Saigon, in Phnom Penh, in the context of bringing together textual authority and lettered intellectualism within a controlled French colonial government institution functioned as a technology of colonial power. The vision and organization of the Directorate of Archives and Libraries was deeply shaped by the only colonial era director, Paul Boudet. Boudet graduated from the renowned Chartres Archives and Library School in Paris as an archivist paleographer. As seen in this quote, Pierre Pasquier, who later becomes Governor General of Indochina, presents Boudet's task as a heroic mandate and glorious duty. Pasquier dreamed of creating an archive and library service in order to preserve the treasure of colonial history. He described Boudet's work of document preservation as a romantic hero's journey, a quest to protect the papers from the environment and the pests which threaten not just destruction of material documents. To protect the documents became an act of preserving colonial history and thus colonial power. So Boudet took on this task of building the collections of Indochina, yet he was also motivated by a hybrid of recent trends in turn of the 20th century French libraries to provide scientifically classified best works to the greater public. Boudet believed that a robust library system had the potential to moralize and educate the masses. 
So I argue that these moralistic justifications for libraries intersected and was intensified by ideologies of the French civilizing mission to bring social progress to colonial Indochina. The legacy of Boudet's work is still present today, since many of the archives classifications in Hanoi, Saigon, and Phnom Penh, and the materials moved to the colonial archives in Aix-en-Provence, France, still follow the same traces or traces of Boudet's classification system. On my visit to the National Library of Cambodia in 2022, a kind librarian staff actually unearthed a huge portrait of Boudet that was just behind in the left wing. Boudet and um, the colonial institutions were also deeply embedded within international public library movements, studying specifically American and English public libraries and the organization of circulating libraries and book wagons projects in America. I discovered that Paul Boudet wrote to American public libraries as well as libraries in China and India to request information on circulating library systems. So this points to significant ways in which models for library development was an international global process that wasn't always stemming from France to the colonies. In the 30s and 40s, a circulating book wagons project rotated around Northern Vietnam, Southern Vietnam, so Cochin China, as well as Cambodge, moving the lending library collections of Hanoi, Saigon, Phnom, Phnom, Phnom Penh connection, collections into the provinces. In 1936, the first Bibliobus or the mobile library book wagon in Indochina began its journey throughout nine provinces in Cochin China including the contested borders region between Cambodia and Cochin China. The library wagon circulated 832 French and Vietnamese language books of popular literature, history, morality, and science from the Saigon Library. Every two months, the book wagon toured through nine provinces, lending books to the readers. A driver from the, and a secretary from the Saigon Library accompanied the wagon. In one year, the book wagon would serve over 20,000 readers. At the same time, book wagons also circulated within Cambodia, moving materials from Phnom Penh into Southeast Cambodia or Southwest Cochin China in the contested Kampuchea Krom region in 1930s. Photographed here is an example of a book wagon initiative spearheaded by Suzanne Carpelez, the director of the Royal Library and the Buddhist Institute. So the movement of books via these wagons is, and into the periphery, into thinking about kind of cultural nationalism that were embedded within this movement is a subject of my future research. So I wanna make sure there's enough time for questions. So I'm just going to actually skip over the second section on publishing landscape. Um, if there's questions about kind of the materials that were in the, the Cambodia library, I can address that in Q&A. I wanna spend a lot of time on this part because it's it's really important to think about, uh, to what Steve was saying, a more bottom up indigenous way of thinking of everyday life and social life in the library. So I want to discuss some of my findings regarding the diverse reading publics in the colonial library. My research contributes to understanding the complexity and diverse range of social life during the colonial period moving from simple characters of colonizer versus colonized. So the majority of users for the library in Cambodia were colonial administrators. They and themselves are a changing diverse group working in various capacities as secretaries, translators, directors of government offices. I also want to focus attention specifically to two other groups, women, children, and students. So I approached the concept of public as an interrelated question of access and use. How accessible was the colonial Cambodia library? How and by whom was it used? So I sought to sketch out a general sense of reading experience of the central library to their, during the colonial period. The colonial library in Cambodia was divided into two services in their respective collections, the reading room for reading materials on site and the lending section to borrow materials home. The reading room provided reviews, dictionaries, and reference works for free consultation on the shelves. Yet the majority of the collection was available only through written submission of a request form. Readers can consult a catalog of the reading room collections organized by alphabet, alphabetically or by thematic topics. Newspapers from France and Indochina could also be requested in this way. So the lending section had a general reading collection 
a popular reading and children's section. Books could be borrowed for two weeks, and if readers failed to return the books or they are late, the borrowing privileges could be revoked. At the time of the Library of Cambodia opened in 1924, the collection consisted of only 2,879 volumes. About 1,000 were absorbed from the Protectorate collection, which was an administrative collection before. There were about 1,600 purchases and 133 donations. The 1930s sees a gradual increase of books through the collection through book purchases and donations. The size of the collection is not as robust as the Hanoi Central Library, uh, which operated as a legal deposit of all new publications in Indochina. By the late 1930s, the daily average of the Cambodia Library was 150 library users. During the colonial period, the library was officially open to the following three groups. Europeans over the age of 16 residing in Phnom Penh, teachers and students in Cambodian higher education institutions, and a nebulous group of other Asians, Asiatic, actually, that was used over the age of 18, who could prove that they had, quote, sufficient education. All users to the library must submit a formal application with their name, profession, home address. For Asian indigenous applica applicants, so this referred to a diverse group of Asian population in Phnom Penh, such as ethnic Chinese, Vietnamese, Khmer, Malay, as well as Indian. This required an additional supporting documentation from an administrator or a school to act as the guarantor. So just in case anything happened that the guarantor could be called in. The racial discrimination perpetuated by French colonialism extended into library regulations and access. So racial differences were explicit in reader card applications and library policies requiring more documentation and guarantors from an Asian reader card applicant. This additional documentation levied against Asian readers functioned as a liability guarantee in case if reader, reading matter that was borrowed was damaged, lost, or stolen. Asian readers were considered a risk to the library and archives collection, and thus additional restrictions and guarantees were placed in their admission to the library. Besides official policy of whom the library was open to, Official library reading rules conveyed implicit norms of behavior of what was considered appropriate behavior in colonial institutions. The official 1924 official rules were also um, specified here. Do not trouble the order of the reading rooms and avoid any unnecessary noise. Do not call out loud to staff. Cases of misbehaviors will be registered in the notebook of complaints. No smoking, no spitting, and no bringing of dogs. By critically examining and questioning these rules, I argue that these rules imported a Western notion of public space and institutions. First, of a bureaucratic notion of reporting and consequences to resolve complaints. Second, of silence and order among reading and readers and reader staff. And third, of an individualized sense of bodily comportment and control in relation to common collective space. So while these rules today might seem generally reasonable to maintain a shared space, the fact is that these rules were, were part of the general introduction and description of the Cambodge library. So the official rules this, where this, this, um, this is published um, in 1924 consisted of 19 articles. Um, the official rules outline a code of consequences for damages and late returns as well as who was admitted to the library. These rules were reiterated as part of the registration stage when a library user was making a library card and also was most likely posted with the interior of the library space. As rules created right at the start of the founding of the Cambodge Library, the rules seem preemptively reactive, proposing a vision of library use through condemning and policing antithetical behavior. Drawing from Ann Stoller's argument of how a colonial documentation reflects colonial anxieties, these library rules are attempts to exert control and promote a vague vision of propriety in a public colonial institution. So besides the top-down vision of quiet controlled order in the library, what did actual library use look like on the everyday level? 
My close investigation of the reading room and lending section archival records, its material collections and historic photographs showcases a more vibrant and diverse use of the Cambodian Central Library. Reg registries of reader visits, their demographics, shed light upon a racialized hierarchy of access to the colonial library collections and space. So I found one such insightful registry of the lending section from 1924 to 1937 that's held in the National Archives today, and that's pictured here. Let's analyze this a little bit. So this registry records a list of borrowers from Cambodian Central Library, noting their names, their addresses, and profession. The majority of names were French, such as administrators, teachers, commercial workers, and professionals such as doctors, lawyers, architects. The first borrower recorded was notably a female, Madame Georgette Collette, followed by a Monsieur Collette on December 29, 1924. The registry also accounts for a number of French female re readers, such as Suzanne Carpelez herself, secretaries, as well as wives of administrators. Other names also include Cambodian readers, such as students from the college um, Fisawath, as well as Vietnamese teachers and low-level administrators, such as clerks and secretaries, who borrow materials to read at home. At times, it's difficult to completely discern race and gender only from record of names. Yet these records point to how the Central Library was a popular resource for a public subset of Francophone indigenous elites, ethnic Vietnamese immigrants and administrators, as well as French expatriates. So my next step is actually to analyze the demographic um, information in here, as well as to spatially plot this borrowing log by address to sketch out a social cultural history of library use as a lens to understand the intellectual life and reading culture of colonial Phnom Penh. What's fascinating about analyzing sources like this is that it points to how a colonial institution could bring together a diverse subset of the population who would come to the library for a range of purposes, for reference material, for their employment, such as colonial administrators and teachers, for leisurely individual erudition, such as working professionals, or others who are supplementing their formal education. How else do we understand the function, role, and everyday use of the colonial institution? A handful of undated colonial era photographs point to use of the library from various groups of readers. This photograph here of the Cambodian Library reading room communicates a certain representation of the room through body language motifs. A male reader, standing, perusing a book, library personnel busily working around their desk, and other readers quietly focus on their reading matter, seated at the table. In this photograph, all the readers appear to be French and all but one of the readers are male. This photograph here shows the lending section collections, which is to the left of the main reading room uh, manager front desk. The photograph shows orderly shelves, empty of readers, an open window possibly for ventilation. Another photograph of the lending section tells a slightly different story. This photograph shows two French women, two young children and a French man posed in front of, front of the lending section loans desk. A French female and an Asian male library personnel appear to be processing the library patron's book lending requests. The two young children appear posed with their illustrated books in hand. The French male reader seems engrossed in his reading material. The recurrence of one of the female readers from the first photograph, the woman in the dark colored hat, suggests that this photograph was possibly taken on the same day and was posed. The body language of this posed photograph conveys a sense of an eager reading public during a regular visit to the Cambodian Library. The Cambodian Library had a separate special collection for children's reading. What was it like to use this collection? So in several articles published, or in several of the published rules for the lending section, specific articles outline children's reading and their permission to access the library. For example, Article 12 explained that readers cannot borrow on behalf of someone else unless it was a husband borrowing from their wives or vice versa or fathers and mothers who could borrow books for their children who are less than 18. Adults are permitted to borrow two books 
irregardless from the adult or children's collection. And children less than 18 can only borrow one book from the children's collection. Also, it's forbidden for children under the age of 16 to be in the reading room without adult accompaniment. The creation of a separate children's collection and detailed rules around children's reading point to the regular presence of children in the library. The library served as an intellectual and leisurely space for French women and their children, a specific group of expatriates who played an important role in French colonial life. Historian Marie Paul Ha argues that French female immigration to the colonies played an important role as, quote, indispensable agents for the domestication of empire. Ha examines the importance of French female professionals, from scholars like Suzanne Carpelez to teachers to healthcare workers. Many of the women were wives and daughters of colonial officials and also played an important role in humanitarian charity efforts as examined by historian Tara Tran. Analyzing these photographs and reading rules and collections showed how the library was particularly important space for French women and their children. I unearthed a valuable source in the archives to highlight a more nuanced understanding of reading practices in the children's collection. A 30s to 40s inventory record of children's collection records 713 French language works. In a cursory analysis of the selection of the literature in the children's collection, the books could be categorized into three characteristics. Adventure travel stories, such as popular works by Jules Verne, such as the adventures of three Russians and three Englishmen in South Africa. Moralizing stories following misbehaviors of children, um, such as the example of um, this book here in the middle, Telemora d'Enfant, What Childish Love. Many of these works are illustrated and published in many popular editions, such as shown um, on the right, the Chamon du Roseland, pictured on the right. So there's much more to be done here, but I really want to rethink and expand our understanding of reading publics as not simply male adults. Furthermore, it's important to think about the legacy and possible value of these collections not just for French children, but also for Francophone Cambodians in the colonial to post-colonial period. In my initial conversations with Phnom Penh residents in 2022, um, they recounted how in their memories of Phnom Penh in the 1970s, the then National Library of Cambodia was a valuable, sp valuable space to read Francophone illustrated works and comics. So in my focus study of the central library collections and library use, I examined how the library served an exclusive group of French colonial expatriates, French women and children, Vietnamese administrators, and a handful of Khmer elites. This subset of the public reflected the limitations and hierarchies of colonial education and the dominance in a Francophone publishing industry by French and Vietnamese publishing houses. In this way, the founding vision, colonial organization, and prohibitive regulations of the central library produce an exclusive institution functionally more like a storehouse than a widely accessible public library. Failing to serve the wider public, the library instead symbolized and formalized a separate sphere of French secular knowledge. By way of conclusion, I call for an ongoing questioning of the meaning of public and must be challenged and revisited, particularly in a colonial context like Cambodia. So my research points to the emergence of overlapping reading publics orbiting around the forces and efforts of two institutions, the Central Library examined today and the Buddhist Institute. So another important public existed in relationship to the Francophone public, the vernacular Khmer reading public, the 1930s and afterwards saw the development of vernacular Khmer publishing industry led by the Royal Library and Buddhist Institute. So there were many different kind of publishing initiatives, publishing Khmer texts, vernacular and canonical Buddhism texts. Um, and I also unearthed that the Royal Library would organize movie screenings and radio that were really valuable, um, radio events that were valuable to oral and non-literate patrons. The Central Library of Cambodia stood like a counter institution to the Buddhist Institute, positioning Francophone literature and the works of documentation purely outside of the efforts of the Buddhist Institute, which, func which functioned as a space to support Khmer Buddhism and vernacular publishing. So how do these two spheres of publics, publishing industries and reading cultures 
differ, overlap, and contest, as well as persist throughout the colonial and post-colonial period. So in this talk, I argue that the Central Library contributed to the institutionalization of a textual authority grounded in secular knowledge, French language texts, and colonial administrative reading matter. Although the library claimed to be open to the public, these texts were housed within a monumental building designed in neoclassical style, is situated within an elite French quarter, further symbolizing colonial authority and privileged access to that knowledge. Beyond my arguments on textual authority and public, my work contributes to rethinking the continued research around questions of literacy, the role of texts, as well as the urban social life of Phnom Penh. So my talk demonstrates how the documentation infrastructure from the colonial period imported a Western concept of textual authority and public that promoted an exclusivity and hierarchy of knowledge. So while the library was limited in popular use and not as accessible to the larger population, the legacies of the library are profound. First, the library and its joint institution of the archives introduced technical practices of documentation, of catalogs, of preservation, and the building of early proto-national heritage collections. The structure of a French library system also introduced public reading spaces and a lending section. Second, the collections of the Cambodge Library were extensive. While Francophone, the collections were cosmopolitan works of popular French literature and Western genres and media forms. So much of these collections remain in material form today and have influence in post-colonial Cambodia. So I'm continuing my work in many different directions, uh, primarily in two. The first is to situate Cambodge Library within the Indochina and global framework of library history. And second, I'll continue to examine the decolonization of the library institution and its cultural and political role during the Sangkum Golden Age period. So thank you again so much um, for this time and opportunity. I so look forward to comments from Steve as well as questions and comments. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Exceeded expectations. Amazing, amazing. I've been asked to show my face, so I'll do that. Um, we, we have a number of questions. Um, the first question asks you to comment on the nature of the central archives and their collections and services, and also on the libraries and archives relations with the prevailing colonial governments. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Gregory Leeser, for this uh, question. Um, I so the nature of the central archives or collections and services. Um, just, just to clarify, this is historically or today, the nature of the central archives. Um, I, I can comment on the colonial period archives and that most of it was operated as an administrative archive. So government offices were expected to deposit their archives within um, the central archives. Um, so the central archives also inherited um, and maintained primarily like the resident superior, the, the government apparatus, the higher level government apparatus archives. Um, it also received kind of more top down materials that were um, from like the governor general, for example, in letters. Um, it also collected um, the archives from the provinces. Um, that being said, the archives um, that were maintained during the colonial period um, are, are very nuanced and, and interesting because it kind of reflects this paper trail of administration, but it's definitely only kind of a, 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 a select kind of paper trail of things of which made it to that, that were preserved. So not everything was officially fire, filed in the archives. I saw many like different types of requests um, 
and letters that were sent to like please deposit materials and materials that were not deposited. And that's um, kind of a constant, uh, that administrative or management work was very important. Um, to the second question, the library and the archives relation to the prevailing governments, that's a really complex question. And I think um, I, I think some of the attendees here, here uh, their work actually look specifically at that, or, um, at that kind of like 1980s, 1990s, um, and kind of today's present day efforts of the archives and libraries, particularly Helen. I think Helen Jarvis is here as well. Um, so I would actually defer more of the kind of the present and kind of recent history of the important um, relationship. That being said, um, the archive in itself is undergoing um, many different efforts. It's overall extremely challenging work. Um, and anyone who's here who's done work in either the archives or, or the library, a lot of it is, it's, it's laborious in a sense that the efforts to, to maintain, to preserve, to recatalog, um, to just figure out what's there, to create an accessible um, like finding aid, computer system and having the labor to do that type of work is incredibly difficult. Um, so it, it's definitely an ongoing effort. Um, the archives and and, and Kao Sony has been like incredibly, the director has been incredibly um, ambitious and has very much prioritized this work of preservation because it is incredibly important work and actually needs much more attention and, and continued support um, from both the government um, as well as from researchers and scholars who come in and kind of respectfully use the collections. But it's not a, it's a very complicated um, story. Um, the, and then, um, yeah, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. So okay, I see yeah, there's, there's several other questions as well. Um, the next question asks about Anthony Barnett's work uh, on Cambodia Will Never Disappear, in which he makes an argument about France's manipulation of Cambodia's Angkorian history to create an inferiority mindset among Cambodians. Um, and based on your work, can you comment on whether the textual authority created by the French also reinforced this argument? And if so, how so? Yes, thank you very much for that um, question. And I, I would say, well, first of all, yes, it definitely creates a hierarchy. Um, the colonial institution itself from like one, one aspect actually that I, um, wish there were more archival records to kind of document is like even the physical structure and the architectural plans. The quote that is plastered right outside of it, la force li en temps, le di en champ pour toujours, like the force ties for a time, ideas bind forever. I mean, there's kind of many ways, or there's a few ways you can interpret this question um, or this quote, but it very much kind of reflects a, colonization of the minds um, that is kind of thinking about ideas, whose ideas are in these libraries, the, the institution itself. These are kind of francophone, like from kind of primarily, I, I mentioned, I had just kind of skip over that, but most of the materials are of materials that are published in Paris of kind of seen as unquestionably um, part of a Western canon of knowledge. And that is what is in, was housed in this library during that time. Um, the textual authority that was, that I argue is very much reinforced of, of a hierarchy of knowledge. Um, what's interesting to think about too, is that the civilizing mission didn't just pertain to civilizing of the colonizer to the colonized of the indigenous population. Many of the administrators and, and the French 
and the, the, the white French um, expatriates who were visiting these libraries were also participating and kind of receiving this civilizing mission, colonial ideology that was kind of promoted both from the metropole and within such institutions. So I think thinking about kind of a more nuanced understanding of, of cultural propaganda and and the civilizing mission or of even thinking of this hierarchy of knowledge that's created in a formal institution such as a, a state public library is really important to think about how moralization is exists both on a kind of a conceptual construct power ideology level of like kind of like the symbol of the, the institution, its architecture, what collections is in, um, as well as the everyday level. And that's what I was trying to get at with thinking about bibliotactics. It's like, all right, so this is users come into this institution knowing it has this like performance of you know, westernization and, and like this hierarchy of French knowledge, but how are they using it? How are they kind of making it their own? Um, and I hope to uncover kind of more of a bottom up understanding of the use of that space um, kind of that defies and kind of rethinks this kind of top down hierarchical colonization of the minds that's kind of purported through the actual infrastructure of the library. Uh, the next question is somewhat related. And the question is, as the French constructed this network of libraries and in so doing projected French power and superiority through the concept of textual authority, to what extent did this authority extend beyond the French residents uh, as self-affirming endorsement of the French civilizing mission? To what extent did it extend beyond that to the Cambodian larger population? Um, and if in fact, the extent to which it extended to the Cambodian, if the extent to which it extended to the Cambodian larger population was limited, can you really say that French constructed textual authority had any real force for projecting French power? Mm. Um, uh, thank you so much for this question. I think I, I saw the question comment um, as I was answering the other question too. So I, I, I'll, I'll I'll point to the second part of your question, which I thought is really interesting, is that like this question of how effective or how how much force did this actually extend? Um, I think you said, if limited, did the French constructed textual authority have any real force for projecting French power? I mean, I think what's interesting is to think about evaluation of of everyday use is really important. Um, so if we think about kind of who, at least during the 30s specifically, was able to come to the library and kind of have just the leisure time, um, the time to actually like from kind of leaving whatever types of duties of like procuring uh, needed for life from their employment or, or to have just the leisure time to come to the library like that in itself is like a very kind of small subset. Um, that being said, this, if you think about kind of this institution as part of kind of a larger like monumental landscape of transforming Cambodia, I would say that even those who didn't necessarily come to the library kind of they could possibly like, there's like a certain awareness of these types of institutions that are not inviting to them that are not kind of designed for the larger population. Um, I mean, this is really significant in thinking about, and this is where more of my additional work, particularly in decolonization is really important. The colonial library becomes a national library and that transformation is, is really important. It's not just the kind of material political um, transformation of authority of who's managing the library and how it kind of comes under the new like post-colonial Cambodian government, but it's the rethinking like where, what role does a national library have in the landscape of like social cultural life of a 
a new nation. Um, and I and I hope to do actually more ad additional and more oral history work um, to think uh, about kind of the transformation of the landscape of of the library at, in the context of urbanizing Phnom Penh. Um, the next question is a kind of informational question asking uh, where exactly is the location uh, depicted in your slide entitled Document and Colonial Power? Um, and where exactly is, is Mr. Paul Boudet sitting in his desk in a room on that same page in your presentation? So I think those are two. Oh, okay, I see the documentation and power on that slide. So that photograph is actually, it still is the, the, um, the director's office um, in the Hanoi Central Library today. So that's the Vietnamese National Library today. Um, where is the picture? Yes, yeah, so um, that's the context for that photograph. So we're we are clear about that. Shall we go on? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the next question has to do with what kinds of information um, and publications and archives are were being retained in the in the libraries and what kinds of publications documents were not being kept or preserved in the library collections and why so what did i understand it is why what did they decide to keep and what they did, did they decide not to keep and why um so that's a really complex question depending on what time period you're uh, we're looking at um i think i think maybe the question is specifically about like for the colonial period um the books for example that were added to the collection well first of all libraries and archives require a lot of money um there's money in terms of kind of maintenance of staff um there's you know facilities like there's actually it's actually quite a um there's an economy of of library and like a financial needs for her library and archives work so a lot of it has to do like how what things actually get um added to the library for example um is re kind of reflected on kind of the financial costs and needs donations were, were definitely accepted um some of the book purchases and this is something that i i didn't quite get to um in my slide, but I think this is a good time to mention it, is that one of my other findings is that I found an inventory of, of book purchases in in the, in the National Archives that looked at um, an inventory of books that were purchased from 1933 to 1943. And that in itself actually followed a certain like geography of books that were available. Um, and, and through more like robust print industries and the print industries that the Cambodge Library relied on that time followed kind of four publishing hubs. Um, a lot of materials published in Paris as well as publishing hubs in Hanoi and Saigon. What I'm most interested in and in thinking about kind of just sketching a landscape of what materials the library added to its collection as well as what thinking about what was available is to look closer at the Phnom Penh publishing industry. I think that's actually an area that needs a lot more attention um, because there actually were a few publishing houses that were set up in Phnom Penh, particularly in the late 30s. Um, and then these materials were then added to the library. Um, 
besides like because publishers the tasks were actually kind of disaggregated you'll have like publishers you have printers you have book binders and I have from my my research kind of in an inventory of those types of purchases as well as you know, their addresses so I really want to actually um, think about creating a more of a landscape of of publishing material to better think about and situate the materials that were that ended up in the National Library. Um, next question asks you whether you're in a position to pursue your analysis on the colonial period into the post-colonial periods, including the present, um, and how things have evolved or changed under successive different post-colonial and current governments. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, thank you so much, Helen, um, for that question. And I, um, I mean, that type of work, I, I do hope to build onto it. I think I'll proceed kind of chronologically and very like materially based. Um, so my next step is to look at um, the Sangkum period, the, the golden age period and thinking about what role the library had um, during particularly in the 50s. A Kamai, Kamai publication was not added in, into the collection until 1954. Um, so even like looking at kind of collections transformation over time is, is one way of looking at it. The challenge here, um, as many who do study Cambodia have experienced is that the archival record is Is, is difficult and it's difficult to parse through. It's, um, I mean, you know, Cambodia experienced like widespread human life destruction as well as with that intellectual destruction and the aftermath of that is still felt within these institutions itself from kind of the knowledge to how to best maintain and preserve these collections to where certain things are, how they ended up there. There's just a lot of kind of archeological, almost like digging and figuring things out. Um, so the post-colonial period, um, particularly, you know, from the 60s and the 70s, like it's it kind of like difficult. Um, so I almost had to, when I was doing the research, I had to kind of work both directions. I looked at the archives materials into the, the resident superior collections. And then I looked at what was there, what was still here today in the National Library and kind of how things got shifted around. And it required kind of a more kind of physical experience, almost like looking at where furniture was moved, where the catalogs were, what was in the catalogs, how, how it's really interesting that particularly like in the, it looks like materials like in the 50s and 60s, you'll see a lot of added materials in the National Library that were based on like donations from all over the world from like, you have, uh, I mean, a lot of the Western world actually. So you have like Russian books, German books, English language books, like all these different types of organizations that come into Cambodia and set up offices and, and kind of donating books in the library and you have like catalogs and subsequent systems. So I had to kind of unearth kind of the layers of those different systems. Um, just because Cambodia's recent history has gone through so much. Um, but it's it's definitely an interesting one, and I don't think I can do that type of task myself. So I invite others to join in this type of work as well. Next question uh, asks you to if you can say a little bit more about what remains um, of the original Royal Library and Buddhist Institute collections and uh, administrative records. So from my understanding and my knowledge, um, I, I mean, most of my work was conducted on the central library, so the, the administrative library. Um, but what my understanding is that a number of the Buddhist Institute materials were lost. They were kind of taken into private hands. Um, some could have been destroyed. It, it was scattered. The Buddhist Institute was shut down for some time as well. Um, during the Khmer Rouge. So it was just a um, experience kind of more of an institutional um, and intellectual destruction. That being said, the new location of the Buddhist Institute and kind of there's been a lot of kind of more efforts of 
recompiling and you know, finding and republishing some of the like serials of the original like 30s and 40s publications. So some of the, the materials are uh, the recompiling actually really, um, the efforts are very laudable. Um, it's tricky though, because even like, the piecing together of the what happened to the Royal Library and materials um, from like its physical movement has been hard to unearth. Uh, I think some oral histories are needed for that. Um, that being said, there's some of the official publications are are starting to get digitized as well. Um, administrative records, I have I have no idea. Um, Carpeles you know, wrote some things as well and, and kind of maintain some records. And some of that is filed and kept into the National Archives. So you have like, a, for example, I unearthed a lot of letters between like the Buddhist Institute, the uh, Suzanne Carpelez to the, the Bibliothèque du Cambodge, the, the French library and basically saying like the Buddhist Institute and these efforts of the Royal Library are different from the Cambodian Library for these reasons. So there was a lot of exchange that was happening there. So some of that um, history of the Buddhist Institute is, um, is preserved through, through the National Archives of Cambodia today. Uh, there are two more questions that are in some ways related. So the first question begins by saying they're convinced by your argument about the institution of the library as a form of colonial power. But then the question is, have you considered ways in which this attempt to establish textual authority failed or was perhaps diverted, transformed or otherwise by users and residents? And the next question is similarly, is there any evidence that the staff of the National Library subverted French colonial power? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I think what um, is is difficult to say from like a like a person that studies libraries and information um, is that yes, on the argumentative level, as Tara was saying, the library is form of colonial power. Um, the claim to establish textual authority was very much a, like if you look at actually the everyday use of the library and, the, and its limitations, in some ways it at, at times operated as a symbolic shell. Um, and it was, and the possibilities of why, how it was kind of diverted or, or kind of undermined was that people weren't paying much attention to it in a sense that they were going to other places. So I don't think necessarily it means that um, it, I mean, it, it failed in the sense that it didn't kind of transform a large public, but in a sense, it also was built on this exclusivity. What's interesting is to then also kind of situate, uh, I think this is where a, a useful case is to situate and think about comparisons within the larger Indochina system. So the, um, the personnel in, so to the question, when Thomas's question about kind of how staff of the library are actually subverting the colonial project, um, the staff um, kind of undergo training officially um, in Hanoi. Um, many of them actually were sent to Hanoi for like a six month pro six month or like apprentice apprenticeship to train in different types of archival and research methods, right? As well as kind of ways to maintain documents. They were trained in like book history from a Western Western perspective, how to communicate materials to like a larger public, et cetera. So that type of information, that technical training was then brought back to Phnom Penh and then um, these archivists, librarian in the 30s and 40s then were distributed to different administrative um, offices. Can you say that that in itself is part of a kind of colonial project? I think in, in some ways like kind of discerning the 
technical kind of from a scientific perspective, kind of the trade of these like documentation efforts is really fascinating and, and to think about because those documentation sciences then were used to build up post-colonial Cambodia. So many of these intellectuals who were, who are these like librarian archivists, they stayed across the colonial, post-colonial and they maintain these efforts um, and they, they carried it and they kind of reinterpreted by, first of all, like renaming things. There's actually, um, that's that's part of like the, like kind of the subverting that happens is, is to think about how operations, language manuals also get kind of renamed from like the central Cambodian library to the, nat like using the, the word national to describe that this is a national library and, and rethinking like how this national library um, in uh, in the 50s was then kind of could reflect the, the nation of, of Cambodia. Um, also the question of kind of kind of comparative work is really important too because um, I'm hoping to unearth kind of more everyday examples of quote like misbehaviors within the library. So uh, thinking from like a subversion, subversive like dissent approach, there are many people who didn't return books from the library. They just like decided to not return it. And then there were kind of serious, particularly in, in the forties throughout the wars, like there was a lot of just readers who would sign up, borrow to books and just never return them. Um, was that like intentional? Was it kind of a kind of a, a different documentation cultural per perspective that they want not want to pay the fine? So that was actually a really major issue during the colonial period. It's like how to enforce all these rules. So I would say like, that's also another way of thinking about dissent is the the neglect um, of of reader roles um, and and then thinking about also like the value of these works for for people like borrowing like an expensive dictionary for example and not returning it and then circulating amongst their colleagues and friends. Um, I'll, I'll switch to one of the questions that's come in uh, via the via, via Facebook now just to keep them in the order in which they arrived. So this question is, what was the colonial period influence of French culture on the function and the use of space in the National Library? So how I understand the question is like, how, what was the kind of thinking about public space That's within the library? was the, the 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 function and the use of space in the national library somehow typically french mm -hmm. culturally speaking mm -hmm. I think. rather than anything else that it might have been whether khmer or vietnamese or whatever one might imagine i think i would say i mean it's i mean on a simple way yes um the bureaucratic nature of it is very um French in a sense of creating reader cards, having all these roles, um, also having the ways in which the materials were organized and what was available kind of for perusal of, of, of reference matter, what was available, like the division, like it, from a library perspective, it was it's very French in a sense that it, the Cambodia library um, copied a model that was uh, the Hanoi model of which was imported from, from France. Um, what, um, what's kind of interesting is that that mall, if you think about kind of libraries development, the notion of a public library in France is also has a really interesting history. Public libraries were also relatively kind of a recent phenomenon in a sense that the public libraries movement France was very much deeply inspired more by the 1890s and like 1900s public library movement in America. Um, because in France, most of the public libraries were actually more like popular libraries or actually more like administrative city libraries. So a lot of the kind of the initiatives that Boudet actually implemented from uh, in Indochina, looking at Hanoi and Cambodia um, were 
kind of a newer form, newer as, and I say like, would say like, was picking up discussion and debate in the 1920s and 30s in France. The question is that like, the question of the public was revisited and really thought about in France in the sense that the, um, the public needed to be kind of moralized, the, public, the French public needed to be moralized and, and civilized and, and kind of brought in terms of having a more of a governmental um, responsibility to the public using book wagons and distribution, thinking about libraries as this like space for, for, for literacy um, and not just for a kind of scholarly erudition. Uh, so I would say what's what's really fascinating about kind of studying the Cambodia and then respectively the Hanoi and Saigon case is that a special, while it is like French in like kind of shape and form, it also had its own colonial character that was a reflection both in a time period and that was built in the 20s and 30s where this notion of like public experimentation was really kind of at a, a new kind of groundbreaking um, intellectual process within in France, but also it was a reflection of how in a colonial situation where there is kind of questions of citizenship and who was the public, was is it the mass of, of indigenous population? Is it those who could read, which were, and in what language? So I think like kind of this revisiting of the public is, is really a fruitful space of of thinking of the colonial library as its own kind of unique hybrid of different kind of political um, and intellectual movements. Um, the next question recalls that before the 19, the 1860s, there were texts on palm leaves in pagodas. Mm -hmm. And the question is, after 1863, were there archives at the Royal Palace or in the administrative offices uh, where such palm leaf uh, uh, texts uh, might have been collected? I think uh, my short answer for that is I, I actually wish I knew more about this. Um, there are, today, actually, there is a small palm leaf collection within the National Library of Cambodia today, of which is, is preserved and some of it's microfilmed as well. Um, the preservation processes of palm leaf manuscripts and thinking about libraries, I would actually defer um, to thinking about um, kind of libraries from a more kind of monastic Buddhist practice, like the the uh, thinking about like the writing of palm leaf as part of like Buddhist tradition and parting part of education of uh, of young um, male monks as well. So I think like that could be another way of looking at it, but I, I actually wish I, I, I knew more about that. Thank you for that question. The next question takes us beyond Indochina to a Thailand or Siam uh, comparison. Um, so the question begins, how might you contextualize the transition of the central library in Phnom Penh into a national library as compared to or connected with parallel developments in Siam, the future Thailand. Uh, I'll, I'll, there's more in the question, but I think we'll start with that and we'll move on uh, so that it's easier to digest. Okay, well, Trent, thank you for your questions. I, I look forward to engaging further. Um, okay, so the first part, I'm just kind of looking over, looking at connection to Siam, Thailand. Um, I mean, I think the short answer is that, yes, I think a regional perspective is is really interesting. Um, I, I have more evidence uh, that I have found of kind of comparison projects between Indochina and, and Dutch East Indies, actually. Um, and that is more of from a, um, from pursuing models of book wagons. So, um, I, I didn't actually come upon too much besides you know, tracking Suzanne Carpelez's training and she, you know, she worked in the, the and she was trained, of course, as you mentioned, in, in Siam. Um, but I think what's interesting is, is thinking about 
this question of, because I, I did a kind of a Southeast Asia survey of thinking about kind of libraries and who, who kind of looks at these libraries. And it, and it looks like most of these library efforts kind of um, have, like there was, of course, like the, the Siam Thai National Library, and then you also have Singapore's National Library. And then the comparison project that I was looking at, for example, in Deshi's Indies, was that France was also looking at kind of earlier initiatives of, of not just creating a national library system, but how to bring libraries manage, libraries as part of a broader cultural propaganda control of print, publishing, and distribution. So it wasn't just thinking about creating like kind of a storehouse of knowledge of a, of a national or proto-national colonial repository of reference materials, but thinking how do we actually create a library system that is kind of integrated within uh, a colonial apparatus of, of print management um, from censorship to publishing or promotion or subsidizing certain pro-colonial publications. So uh, uh, colonial Indochina, France actually looked quite closely to the Dutch East Indies and modeled kind of a more um, like a, a kind of a blatant top-down surveillance apparatus from the Dutch East Indies. Um, and then I think there's a second part of that question. Local publishing landscape, is that the? I'm so, yes, I'm so happy that um, this would be valuable because I found this and I just was trying to unearth it and, and try to see what other types of works, um, who, what other scholars have written on vernacular publishing. Um, so, what I what I found out is that yes, I think there's like this landscape geography of publishing. Um, I hope to kind of dive into like the, the individuals as well. Like there's actually like for whatever reason, the library kept purchasing works from uh, someone named Win Van Kin, who is a book bindery. So I'm I'm sure there's kind of other tracks of like purchases and other things that um, kind of refer like where is this person Kin getting his books to bind or are they kind of service to that? So it's a, I think there's like actually an, a whole industry um, economics um, aspect of looking at uh, bookshops and how the materials are circulating. Um, and it's it's hard to find this type of material because um, a lot of it you know, isn't really written um, and, and archived. Um, I think the, I'm lucky in that I found also like addresses that are associated with it. So I think like a geospatial analysis of this is is apt for that. But what can I ask was was yes. was the National Library collecting things in Vietnamese Vietnamese and Chinese newspapers or anything of that sort? Not during the colonial period okay. um, that I that I found, unless they're the hard thing is what I have to find is actually I need to read to to kind of unearth the catalog um, of the library. Right now it doesn't look like there was. I don't exactly know when. Um, Kamai, I know that Kamai was uh, materials were added in the fifties. Um, Steve, to your point about newspapers, there were most likely. Um, there are definitely metropolitan newspapers, but there is most likely also newspapers published within the colonies. I know they're definitely French. I don't know if they were necessarily collecting Vietnamese language newspapers. Um, I could do like a kind of, so this is like a little bit of like an archaeological and everything. So I, what I have to do is I have to then look at the materials that are there and then try and figure out their accession dates. Um, but that in itself is like hard. Um, because it could have been added later on. So a lot of this is a little bit like you have to make some like probability of like, were they there and were they accessible? The ideal is actually to unearth more of kind of the use. So um, the, the lending section, so the lending section isn't borrowing newspapers necessarily, the borrowing literature at least is um, kind of having names of individuals and their professions. And then the other kind of more nuanced understanding of use is the, the children's literature collection. 
so that I, I have like what is is checked out. Very good. Um, uh, that, that's the, those are the, that's the end of the questions that have come in. I, I have a question of my own to, to close with. So when you were going through the the records of the borrowers, did you see the names of any future famous or infamous Cambodian political figures? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so probably the one like famous person that's associated with um, the library, at least that I could speak to, is Pak Chon, who actually is the founder of Nagaravata, the one of the first kind of non-Buddhist um, publications that is really actually focused more on like pro-independence that was in the 30s. And then he later then becomes the director of the of the of the of the library in the post-colonial period. So that is in, I believe, 1951. But he he's actually not, I mean, he of course will be reading there, but he was actually one of the first um, Cambodians to be formally trained in archives and libraries and completed his work in Hanoi in the 20s and then works throughout the colonial period and then becomes the director. Um, so so I would say like that's an, one individual. And then the other thing is a lot of the readers in the borrowing longs are actually the librarian staff. So you see like that's, they're the most avid readers because they are there and um, they don't always log their reading activities, but um, it's interesting just to see them as a kind of a intellectual political class of their own. Okay, very good. I, I, again, I, I mean, it's such a such a wonderful presentation, such fluent responses to all the various questions. Um, it's been a it's it's been a great webinar. So thank you for all of your work and your presentation. Thank you, thank you so much, Steve, for your remarks, and thank you everyone who was able to attend. And of course, thank you again to CKS.